Thank you, Jay. Th and thanks to uh, Brendan and Aaron for, for putting this, the, this talk together and the series together. Um, and I, like, I've, I don't know if I've ever had, ever had two introductions before, so <laughs> this is great, especially to a group who mostly know who I am already. So um, raise your hand if you had me for analytical tools. All right, about roughly half, okay. Um, and then otherwise, I'd like to, so I've, I, a lot of you do look familiar. I forget when I've seen you before. So how many are second years? Okay, and how many first years? Okay, cool. And otherwise, it's a couple faculty and things like that lurking around, so, um, okay. Um, so this is fun for me. So I, I've, I've talked to a lot of you about class stuff. Um, but this is my research, and normally when I talk about research, you know, the first slide is a whole bunch of equations, and then the second slide is a whole bunch of equations, and people are really kind of getting into the nitty-gritty and things like that. What's fun, for this, what's fun for me about this is that you guys have sort of a different perspective, and, you know, heaven forbid you're actually interested in sort of the big picture and the business applications and things like that, which is, which is a lot of the motivation why I do research in the first place. Um, I, now, having said that, um, I, I talked to Brendan earlier, and I promised Brendan there would be no equations um, in the talk. And I've like, I've, I uh, fell short on that a little bit, but they're not too bad. I think Brendan sort of previewed it for me, and he like wasn't too scared by it. So hopefully we're okay. Um, okay, as Jay mentioned, this is actually joint work with um, two former uh, colleagues of mine at Chicago, um, Nicole D. Horatius and Linus Schrage, who. Um, are, who I continue to work with, and this, I'm gonna mainly going to be talking about one research paper, but this is also part of sort of a stream of work uh, that goes on. So um, one of my core research interests is in retail, um, and one thing I like about retail, so you know, as Jay introduced me, I'm, you all know me as the analytical tools professor. I also am in the operations group, and I also teach operations. Um, and the nice thing about retail is that it sort of brings those two things together. So it's operations, obviously. I'm worried about sort of uh, inventory and things like that, but there's also analytical tools, a lot of data involved, and, and you'll see, I'll, I'll bring a little bit of analytical tools up as I go through this, okay? So you have that to look forward to. Um, let me start with a little bit of a story. Um, it's not an especially interesting story, but it's sort of a motivating story. Um, this actually, this is a true story. It happened to me a couple of years ago when I was living in Chicago. Um, so I moved to a new apartment. I was decorating the apartment. I decided I fell in love with a five by eight foot Henley rug from the Pottery Barn catalog. So I'm, we've all familiar with Pottery Barn, I imagine, okay. Um, this is it, um, and this tells you a little bit about my sense of style, <laughs> that I would fall desperately in love for a beige rug with a beige border around it, okay. And we actually, um, I, I, this, at last time I checked, this still sits on the floor of my living room underneath a coffee table, and my wife is trying to get rid of it with something a little bit more interesting. But at the time, like, put yourself in the shoes of me who, really wanted this rug, okay? Um, so here's, here's, the, here's the story of how I came about. So the first thing I did was I looked online, and we all shop online quite a bit. I went through the process until I realized that shipping was going to be 10% of the purchase price. Um, money doesn't grow on trees, as you know, so I decided this was not going to be a, a, a legitimate option. Um, my second try was to visit a local store. So I don't know if those of you who, li who are familiar with Chicago. So I live pretty close to Michigan Avenue, which is kind of the main shopping drag in Chicago. Um, and the plan was I was going to, there was a pottery barn on Michigan Avenue. I was going to walk down to Michigan Avenue and get this rug and like lug it on my shoulder back home. Um, now you might ask, why wouldn't I just park there or get a taxi? That would clearly eat into the savings um, that I, the whole reason I didn't buy it online in the first place. So. <laughs> Um, I go to Michigan Avenue, and it turns out they had they were out of stock, right? So frustrating. Um, at this point, I really wanted the rug, okay? Um, so my third try was actually to visit a distant store. I had a car. Um, the nearest store was a 40-minute drive away, um, and this time I wisened up a little bit. I called ahead to confirm availability, and the nice person on the other line said, uh, the computer says we have four in stock, all right? So all set. So I get in the car, uh, drive 40 minutes um, to the... Sub to the suburbs, when I get there, um, they couldn't find any rugs to sell me, right? Even though there were actually li four in the computer system. So the question is, where were the four rugs? Well, um, it, uh, like this, uh, like I was at the store, you know, uh, this is where an uh, operations professor can be annoying. I had the store manager involved and we were investigating and all this kind of stuff. So we found two of the four rugs, all right? The first one 
uh, was in a floor display. So this is a photo of a pottery barn. And you actually can see my rug uh, right down <laughs> here, okay? And this store had a rug. It was on the floor. It's part of this sort of simulated living room type thing. It was clear this wasn't for sale, right? They weren't going to just like pick up this rug and give it to me. Also, it was like dirty. There was like a piece of bubble gum stuck in the corner and things like that. So this was not really available to me as a customer, okay? Uh, the second one was actually, they, you know, Pottery Barn has these little display racks of rugs, and one of them was actually hanging from the display rack. Again, not totally clear if it was for sale, not totally clear if that was part of the inten intended four rugs that they had reported to me. Um, and then two, we, we never found, okay? Um, so in the end, what, you know, there's a negotiation. I convinced the store manager to give me the one off of the rack. He gave me a little bit of a discount. I still own the rug to this day, all right? So it has a happy ending. But sort of this highlights a, a problem that a lot of retailers face, um, which Jay has already brought up, um, which is inventory record inaccuracy, okay? So this is sort of a, um, I don't know if it's a secret or not, but sort of a fact of life in, in the retail industry is that what the retailer has in their computer system is not necessarily match what they have on the shelf, okay? Um, and the w one question is why. So we're in an MBA classroom, um, so I left this intentionally blank so that we can have a conversation about it. Um, any, any ideas or thoughts why? Yeah? L delays? Logging delay. Okay, so you mean like they, they may have gotten a shipment and they haven't recorded it yet or something like that? Okay, I actually hadn't thought of that one. That's a good, okay, sure, fair enough. JB? Right. Theft? Okay, yeah, so theft certainly is one of them. So either uh, you know, unfortunately, when a customer shoplifts, they're not nice enough to sort of tell it as they leave the door so that you can update your inventory record. So, uh, so shoplifting, and of course, uh, employees will, will thieve as well, right? So, um, so theft is certainly, is certainly one. And, and you know, when I first came to this problem, so my colleague Nicole was sort of the one who was originally interested in the problem when she started describing to me, that's, that's kind of what was in my mind, shoplifting, right? Um, turns out that's not the whole story, but that, that it is something that retailers certainly worry about. Aaron? Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, okay. The store might not just just quit the loss of it. They actually see the person come and say, yeah, I've got everything. And so they kind of might have to figure out what those counts are. Okay, yeah. So th there's, there's sort of a process whereby stores, you know, they process what's coming into the store. You want to sort of reconcile, you know, you, I may have ordered uh, 11, and the, the distributor just sent me 12 because that's a full case or something like that. And maybe I was lazy about, about um, recording it in the system. So that's certainly, that's certainly relevant. Yeah? Maybe they are simply misplaced because they have it on inventory, but they don't know exactly where they are. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So that's, then that certainly could have been the case with my rugs. It could have been that one was, you know, the back room, uh, I ended up going back there. Um, it was somewhat chaotic, and like it might have been somewhere, and just they, they wouldn't have they wouldn't have been able to find it for me. And essentially, that would be a stock out from my perspective as a customer. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying, yeah, so you're saying that there's, like, with reconciliation, it's possible that, like, in this example, maybe four customers came that day and bought them, and they sort of hadn't updated the computer yet or something like that. So that's certainly a possibility. These actually are good. So I, some of these I know, some of these I hadn't thought about, so that's a good idea. Okay, yeah. Okay. So they sort of, yeah, so the store manager may be playing some game, and so he knows, there's, he knows that we don't have any in stock, but he's sort of, uh, he's sort of, afraid to admit it or something like that. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, I okay. Do you have retail experience? Yep. That's right, yeah. So the sort of recording the wrong item, you're talking about the returns, it could also happen on the, on the point of sale as well. So one cla there's, a, there's actually a story, the classic is, um, you know, you buy a Coke and a Diet Coke, right? And they're the same price, so the cashier just rings the, the Coke twice, right? So what happens, well suddenly the store thinks, you know, suddenly it's down a, co uh, it's down a Diet Coke relative to what it thinks and it's up a, a Coke relative to what it thinks, right? So that type of thing can screw it up. There's actually, um, there's a story, and my colleague actually tells this story that um, the, uh, they, they talked to a grocery store at one point and uh, medium tomatoes, uh, they sold 25% more medium tomatoes than they actually got shipments for, 
okay? Um, so you ask what's going on, and they it sort of d dug deeper, and it turns out that the cashier knew the little four-digit code for medium tomatoes, and when someone bought like a large tomato or an organic tomato or something like that, they just like ca called it a medium tomato. Um, so this is how the store managed to sell more medium tomatoes than they actually had, right? So these types of things, you, you're talking about the returns, but also on the point of sale can, can affect it as well. So um, yeah, so the good, uh, it turns out I did have a list. If I can get it to work, are we? Um, um, we've talked about some of these sort of replenishment errors. We talked about um, uh, theft rather than being employee or customer theft. Oh, damage is one, okay? So if you're in the grocery store and you I have a toddler, so I know all about this. You knock over a jar of jelly, um, and you have to call someone to mop it up. They don't always like record that that happened. Okay, so damage. We're ahead of ourselves here. Um, damage, um, human error in the inventory audit. So when when they count things, they could sort of miscount. And um, we talked about misplacements and incorrect recording of sales. And there may even be other reasons that uh, that I'm sort of not even entirely aware of. Okay. Um, so uh, let me talk, this actually isn't my work, but let me talk a little bit about some of the empirical work around this. So um, one of the studies rega re regards a co company called Gamma Corporation. Well, that's not really its name. Um, we're in a lot of these things, uh, understandably, retailers are not eager to, for everyone to know um, how bad their operations are. Um, and I, by the way, I shouldn't pick on Pottery Barn necessarily. It's just an example. I don't know anything about whether how good or bad their operations might be. Um, Anyway, so the Gamma Corporation is not really called Gamma Corporation. It's actually a retailer that you, I'm sure you all know, I'm sure you've all been inside a Gamma Corporation store. Um, it's actually a well-known national retail chain and actually a relatively sophisticated one in terms of its um, technology adoption and things like that. Um, so my colleague actually took data from the annual physical audits from the store. So this store, you know, they close down roughly once a year. They get all their staff in, they count up everything that they have, and they figure out, they compare that to what was in the computer system. Um, she actually took audit data from 37 stores or 370,000 SKUs. So SKU, retail world, a SKU is a unique sort of product that the store offers. Um, and sort of the striking number that she found is that 65% of the inventory records were actually wrong. So only 35% were right, 65% were wrong, okay? Um, and this is, a, this is actually a histogram of, of all the errors. The 35%, if you see an error, this is the histogram of all the different errors. The error of zero means that it was correct, and that only happened 35% of the time, okay? So a lot of them are small. I mean, a lot of them are off by one or two, um, but they can be big. So they found one as large as 7,000 off. Um, I don't know how that happened, um, but she literally, um, she did, I don't know, she literally <laughs> found there was like crates and crates of some item in the back and no one quite knew why they were there or, or, or whatever. So um, one, thing that, one thing to notice about this histogram, so this is recorded minus actual. So the ones over here mean that the, the computer said more than what we had and this says we had less, the computer said less than what we had. Um, one thing that's striking to me about this is that it's, it's not exactly symmetric but there's a lot on the left side and there's a lot on the right side which means so sort of me and JB's initial intuition that this is all shoplifting and theft is, can't be quite right. That would, mean, um, that would mean we'd be all sort of over on this side. So there's obviously more going on than just that, although that, that is a factor, okay? Um, so it's, it's somewhat symmetric and, and this is, you know, this, we get a sense for sort of the spread um, of all the different errors that are out there. Um, we talked about misplacements a little bit. So misplacements, um, you can think of it as something that's different in that like, well, it's still in the store. We haven't actually lost the items. Um, but from the customer's perspective, it's kind of the same thing. Um, one study at a, a specialty retailer um, just looked at all the stockouts the customers saw. And it, they found that 16% of stockouts were due to just statistically high demand. Okay, And this is, you know, you all have taken operations, uh, talked about something like the news vendor problem, right? So the news vendor problem, you stock, um, so you leave yourself some risk that like demand will be really high and you'll stock out. Well, that's in, you expect to stock out once in a while because of that. Um, so 16% was actually due to that, just kind of the realities of the news vendor problem. 24% um, were caused by record inaccuracy and 60% were actually caused by misplaced inventory. Um, and one particular study on Borders Bookstore, 
Um, so Borders Victor, if you think of a bookstore, there's a lot of SKUs in relatively small quantities, right? So there's lots of different titles of books, and they might only have one or two copies of each book. What they found is that 3% um, of the store's total assortment, so 3% of all the titles that Borders carried, um, were actually in the storage area, but not on the selling floor, or not at least findable on the, on the selling floor. Um, and another, another statistic is that um, of all the customers who ask for help, so if you, go, if you go to Borders and you can't find the book you're looking for, you go find someone and ask for help. Of all those kind of inquiries, 18% um, of the time, um, they never found the book, even though it was later found to be physically present in the store. Okay? Um, so you can think in a bookstore, misplacements is a series, you know, if there's, there's only one copy of Pride and Prejudice, right? And uh, I, I take you to a, book to a border and I say, go find it. Um, how are you ever going to, it's a needle in a haystack kind of problem to find that, okay? Um, so this is, this is a serious issue. The same study found that misplacements, they calculated that reduced store profits by about 25%. Um, which is, that's a big number, yeah. Um, okay, so exacerbating factors, sort of, if those of you are sort of interested in the empirical side, um, it turns out that record accuracies are worse uh, f when you have high inventory levels. So products that you have a lot of stock of um, tend to have a problem. When there's a lot of product variety in the store, that tends to make the problem worse, as you might expect. Um, clearly, things like employee turnover or limited training of employees is, is, is a, has a negative impact. Uh, as, is, as does the employee workload. Um, another kind of interesting, a uh, couple of interesting facts is that it turns out it's less severe um, for high price items and for items shipped directly from the vendor to the store. So stores will receive items directly from the vendor. They'll also receive some from their sort of the, the chain's own distribution center. Um, and the errors are less severe for the ones that are shipped directly from the vendor. The reason for these that has been identified is that employees sort of care more about these items. So they care more about the high price items and they care more about things shipped directly from the vendor. Um, the reason for this is that uh, if, if items are shipped from the vendor and they're wrong, you can call the vendor and get a refund. If they come from your own store's distribution center and they're wrong, you don't get a refund. So, uh, so, so employees are sort of motivated to look for these types of items. Okay. Um, okay. Let's think for a little bit about sort of how this, you know, th this, is, this is a big problem. A lot of retailers have this issue. Um, what are some of the costs? Well, uh, the first one is that it becomes harder to match supply with demand. If you think of what's the, what's, what does a retailer do, okay? Um, now, the marketing group has their own impression of what a retailer does. From the operations perspective, it's about matching supply with demand, right? You need to f forecast what demand's going to be and you want to make sure you have the right inventory on the shelf to meet it, okay? And this obviously makes that harder. Um, you know that if we have a lot of demand uncertainty, like in the news vendor problem, you tend to hold a lot of inventory to sort of buffer that uncertainty, okay? And in this case, having uncertainty around what's actually on the shelf is an additional amount of uncertainty, and so you actually hold even more uh, inventory in this case. Um, now, and if you don't do that, then of course you lose sales, you lose customers, and, uh, and things like that. So there's sort of a, sort of a natural operational issue. There's, um, there's costs, there's sort of direct costs, cost of auditing, cost of correction. I'll talk a little bit later on about auditing, so how, you know, how, how stores go about that. But in the end, you have, to, you have to hire people and pay people by the hour to sort of count all the things in your store periodically, okay? Um, IT systems and optimal policies may not live up to their billing. So what this means, you know, you all, you take up, and uh, I know Wendell and Ada and Brian Tomlin are not here, so I can say this. Uh, you all, like, you know, spend a lot of time worried about, you know, what inventory policies to use and what's, to, what's the optimal Q star and all this kind of stuff. Um, it turns, if you don't know what's on the shelf, uh, this is, you know, what is it, what's this, all this stuff mean, right? So uh, you definitely need to know this stuff. It's very important. But um, uh, my, my point is that, you, that, you know, all the optimization in the world or sort of smart mathematical calculations can fall short if you're sort of making the wrong assumptions, okay? Um, and then finally is one that I actually find interesting um, that I've talked to retailers, and this is an issue that they really worry about, something that we've called inventory freezing. Um, so here's a situation with inventory freezing. Suppose that I have... I'm stocked out on the shelf, but I have my inventory, my computer says I have 10, okay? Um, how many am I gonna sell of that item? Zero, okay? I have nothing on the shelf, so I can't sell anything. Uh, how much am I gonna order for that item? 
0. Because I already have 10. The computer system knows I have 10. It's not going to place an order if I have 10, right? Um, so what happens? Nothing ever happens in this case. It's like inventory gridlock, right? So uh, I don't sell anything because there's nothing on the shelf, but I never order anything because I'm not selling anything. You can kind of get this vicious circle going on. Um, and this is, this is an issue. In the long run, what, you know, the problem is that retailers eventually can say, well, there's no demand for this product. I'll actually remove it from my assortment altogether. So there's all kinds of sort of insidious things that can happen here. Um, at Gamma Corporation, it turns out 12% of the items had, uh, there was no inventory in the stock, but there was a positive inventory record. So not, these weren't necessarily all frozen. Um, but they're sort of candidates for freezing, and this is this, it's, this. Hopefully, it's obvious that this is a really bad thing that could happen. Okay. Um, okay. So, th so the question is, what to do about it? And this is kind of the essence of what I'm meaning to say to you today. Um, we can classify sort of solutions into three different categories. Um, so the first is prevention, um, which is kind of the obvious one. So basically, you know, go to the root cause and try to eliminate the source of the problem. So. Uh, what this could mean is better processes and conformance. Um, so, you know, w one retailer we've talked to, they, um, they had a back storage area, and basically what happens is when stuff came into the store, if they didn't have enough room in the shelf, they'd just stick the extra in the back storage area. But there was no sort of record keeping, and it was really up to the, um, it was up to the employees' memories to, to remember what was in the back area and remember to bring it up front. Well, clearly, once things get busy, they're not going to do that. So having sort of better processes for sort of moving things around the store is useful. Um, and the second sort of obvious thing is something like tracking technology. So RFID is big these days. Um, and that's clearly would have some, um, would have some impact on record and accuracy, okay? Um, having said that, RFID is not perfect. First of all, it costs money. Um, now the tags cost a few cents, but readers cost thousands of dollars to install. So there's, a, there's quite a cost to implementing RFID. Um, and given turning technology, RFID is not perfect either. So there's errors in these rates and, and so forth and so on. So um, I'm actually a fan of RFID as, as, a, as a possible solution, but it's not kind of the whole solution. Okay. Yeah? What's RFID? Oh, that's a good question. So RFID stands for radio frequency identification. Um, so it's these little, they look like little stickers with metal in them. They're little tags, and there's electronic readers that, that and these little tags basically they're basically little memory chips that have stored on them some information, um, and then you can have a you can have a big reader um, in your store that sort of transmits and is able to read these little cards. So the idea is that you'd stick an RFID tag like on each item, and you'd have a reader in your store that sort of is able to count how much of that item is is around. Okay, that's in theory that's what happens. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes, if you buy, sometimes if you buy like a piece of uh, clothing, you'll find it's a little square with like kind of a little copper spiral in, inside. That's 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 a version of an RFID tag, typically. That's right. Will the barcodes also act like a tracking technology? Does that help? So yeah, RFID has some things in common with barcodes. So the question is about barcodes. Um, <coughs> RFID has some things in common with the barcode. The trouble with the barcode is that you, you know, you've been to the grocery store. For the barcode to be read, you really have to sort of bring it right next to the reader. Okay. Um, the advantage of RFID is you can read it from more of a distance, and that's, you know, from from the perspective of record and accuracy, RFID is sort of more valuable because, you know, shoplifters are clearly not going to like scan their items as they leave, right? So we need something that's a little bit more omniscient than that um, to, to to handle this problem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, clothing, yeah. That's uh, so. The question is whether like the, whether record and accuracy differs across retailers and things like that. Certainly, different retailers have different processes in place. Some just I mean, some retailers just sort of more sophisticated than other ones, and some have good reasons. I mean, I've talked to people um, in like the jewelry industry, right? And they're like record and accuracy isn't a huge problem there because they you know there's lots of checks and balances, and they keep things in safes and things like that, right? Um, it's certainly an issue in grocery stores. It's certainly an issue in, um, 
sort of your big box retailers, um, things like that. I don't, ha I don't, I don't have concrete, concrete evidence about sort of different types of stores and where it might be better or worse. But you can, we, can, uh, we can think about um, reasons why some would care more about it than others and, and, and things like that. So, and some, the, the irony is that in some, you know, for instance, with inventory freezing, inventory freezing is caused by interaction of sort of your automated systems and this problem. Some of the more sophisticated retailers, you could argue that this is even more of a problem for them because they're even sort of more automated and things like that, right? So um, it's not necessarily just a, fa a factor of sophistication of the retailer. So, okay. Um, all right, so that, that's prevention, and I, I think prevention is a great thing to do. Um, I'm not going to talk much about it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about correction. So pr correction is actually counting things. Um, and then I'll talk mostly about integration, which is the idea that basically, you know, we admit that the problem's happening and we take steps to sort of run our store efficiently given that reality, okay? Um, so we'll talk about integration a fair amount and a little bit about correction. All right, so um, this is the crux of our proposal. So this is kind of our invention. Um, it's the kind of thing, I think when you look at it, you're gonna say, well, this it sort of makes sense that you do this. Um, you think about traditional inventory record, um, essentially, it says that, you know, essentially a traditional inventory record, traditionally retailers would just keep a single number in the system representing how much inventory they have. So the inventory record of five basically says we have five on the shelf, okay? Um, and what happens with the five? Well, if you, if you receive a replenishment, so if I get five more um, in a shipment, then, I, then this goes up to 10. If I sell some, then it goes down. You know, if I sell three, then it's go down, gonna go down by three. So the mathematics are pretty simple in terms of how you'd, how you'd manage this, okay? Um, uh, the basis of our proposal is that, well, if you really don't know what's on the shelf, you should be sort of forthcoming about that, right? You should be, you should represent your inventory as a probability distribution. So instead of saying there's five widgets on the shelf, I say now, well, there's either four, five, or six widgets on the shelf with some probabilities, okay? So um, we're, ba we're actually proposing that the retailer keep this as their inventory record. So what is this? Well, it's a little histogram. I think there's five on the shelf with probability 0.5, four on the shelf with probability 0.2, and six on the shelf with probability 0.3, okay? Um, and we call this a Bayesian inventory record. I'll explain later why we call it Bayesian, but it's sort of, it's sort of an expanded notion of an inventory record that sort of really cap more accurately captures our state of knowledge about what's really on the shelf, okay? You have to remember that stores these days have tens of thousands of, of different SKUs, and so it's, you know, the, the, the only way for the manager to sort of have, know what's going on in his store is through his information systems, okay? Um, so this is, this is what we're gonna be, this is what I'm proposing. Um, and then the, what I'll talk about the rest of the time is basically how do we sort of, how do we make this operational? So the first thing is how do I compute this and how do I update it over time? Um, <coughs> There's certain, uh, there's certain estimations, so how do I estimate, there's some error process going on, how do I estimate that from data? Um, and then how do I use this to make replenishment decisions and finally auditing decisions, okay? Um, number two, I'm not gonna talk too much about, that's in some sense that's really the statistical question here, is given a bunch of data, how do you figure out sort of how much shoplifting is going on and things like that? We've done work on that, we're actually ongoing work on that, um, but I, I, I couldn't think of a nice way to sort of talk about it without getting into a lot of boring details. So we'll talk about boring details around the other things. Um, all right, so the first is how do I actually compute it or update it? Um, let me first make it, so remember, we're, think about we have this probability distribution representing how many widgets we have on the shelf, okay? We have the one from yesterday, you have to figure out what the one for today is, okay? So the first fact I'll sort of throw out is that uh, because sort of uncertainty sort of accumulates over time, this Bayesian inventory record sort of spreads out over time. So there's sort of more variance as time goes on. Why? Well, because like, you know, there's, there's a possibility of shoplifting, there's a possibility of misplacements and all these things that are happening. I don't obviously see them happening, but I know they might happen. And because of that, sort of I have less and less knowledge about what's on the shelf as time goes on. Right? So this is kind of the first thing. Um, there's all there's various things that I can observe in the system. So first off, suppose I see a replenishment. So suppose that I get a shipment of one widget. Um, well, that's actually pretty easy. Um, you take your existing Bayesian inventory record and you shift it up by one unit. So this is the same 
histogram just sort of shifted up one, right? Just reflecting the fact that I have one more than I did yesterday, okay? Um, here's another thing that you could happen in the store. You count and you find four widgets on the shelf, okay? Um, well, this one's also pretty easy. Well, if I count four widgets on the shelf and if I trust my own counting, um, then now I put 100% weight that I actually have four items on the shelf, okay? Um, so today's inventory record would look like this, all right? So this, these, are, these are both relatively straightforward. Um, another one I'll throw out there is what happens if I observe sales? It turns out if I observe sales, things get a little bit more complicated. And let me sort of talk about this for, for a few minutes, okay? Um, all right, so here's a, here's a very simple example. Um, so suppose that, suppose that uh, this morning I open up the store and I think I have a 50% chance there's nothing on the shelf and I have a 50% chance that there's one item on the shelf, okay? That's the situation when I open the store in the morning. And, you know, in history, I know that the demand for this product is, is actually looks like this. So the, the demand is going to be zero with a half probability and it's going to be one with a half probability, all right? So I don't know if demand is going to be zero or one, but it's 50-50 one way or the other. Okay, so very simple. This is about as simple as we can get in terms of a, a problem that actually has uncertainty around how much is on the shelf and uncertainty around demand, okay? Um, suppose we observe zero sales, okay? Um, and we want to we wanna update this probability distribution to reflect the knowledge that we saw zero sales today. Any thoughts? Okay, so the, 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 I mean the first, the first reaction would be to be the same, right? So in some sense, I started out like this. In some sense, nothing happened, right? So it ought to be the same, right? So that's sort of, that's one, yeah, that's one idea. Okay. Okay, like this, right? Okay. Yeah, so it, it, I, I, I agree with your intuition, and when I first thought of this problem, I was exactly with you. It turns out it's a little bit more subtle than that, right? So let's take the, let's take, what's your name? Okay, so let's take Shashank's approach. Um, there's four states of the world that could happen today. Um, demand is e either going to be zero or one, each with a half probability, and available inventory is either going to be zero or one with a half probability. And we'll assume that everything's independent and things like that. Um, what that means is that there's sort of four possible things that could happen. Demand, you know, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. All right? Everyone with me? All, all four of these rows are equally likely to happen. And you know, we can compute what sales are. Um, clearly, if demand is zero, sales is zero, and if available inventory is zero, then sales has to be zero as well. The only way I sell something here is if I had something on the shelf and there was also demand for one unit, okay? Um, now suppose we observe zero sales, okay? Well, if I observe zero sales, that means I'm in one of these three rows, right? Um, and if you look, each of these three rows is still gonna be equally likely among themselves. Um, in these three rows, there's actually two rows that have available inventory with zero, and there's one row that has available inventory of one. So if I think about what the new Bayesian inventory record is going to look like, it actually looks like this. Okay, so um, we started out with this, we observed zero sales, and we go to this. Okay. Um, <coughs> intuition about why this is the case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's a rough, that's roughly right. Um, put yourself in the shoes of the store manager, right? So in the morning, I don't I don't know exactly. I don't know if I have something on the shelf or not. Okay. I observe zero sales, and there's a little bit of doubt on my mind about why that's the case, right? It's possible that. I didn't sell anything because just no customer showed up today. It's also possible I didn't sell anything because I didn't have it on the shelf, right? And the sort of the lingering doubt that I might have not, it might be because there's, there's nothing on the shelf causes me to sort of inflate the belief that I might, that I'm actually stocked out. Okay, does this make sense? Okay. Why is it not three quarters of the um, This comes from, 
I'm not going to spare you this, but uh, my, the tricks, if I, if I really want to explain this, I would draw a Venn diagram on the board and sort of go through how this works. Um, the reason is because, so the basic reason is because, um, you know, when we see sales of zero, we can exclude this last row, right? So this one's totally gone. There's only three possibilities left. So it's really, we're talking about two out of three and one out of three at that point. Okay. Um, the real, so the real updating equation is this, all right? So Brent and I, this is what I was trying to avoid. Um, <laughs> So it turns out, it's, I showed you a very simple example, okay? But it's an example that's rich enough to give you sort of the intuition about what's going on. This is, and it all is hairy detail, this is it, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go through that in detail. So um, the first, my first comment about this, is this is an application of something called Bayes' rule, okay? So Bayes' rule, um, we talked in, in analytical tools, or actually in ASW, about the, the multiplication rule. Um, it's basically that, okay? Um, the Bayes rule is valuable. It's actually something that I deal with a lot in my research because Bayes rule allows you to sort of incorporate information that you accumulate over time. So if, you're, if I sit here with one state of knowledge and I get some sort of a signal about the world, I use Bayes rule to sort of update my beliefs, okay? Um, so basically, Bayes rule is these equations and it basically gives you um, what, we, what we just went through. Um, and in particular, but intuitively, the updating reflects this sort of this sort of signaling aspect of sales. So if you think about it, um, when I make a sales observation, that tells me a little bit of something about what happened on the sales floor, and I can use that information to my advantage, okay? Um, so in particular, what we just saw is if, if, I, if I see no sales, then it's possible that I, the reason I didn't see sales because there was nothing on the shelf, and I sort of incorporate that into my, into my beliefs. Um, and a second one is that obviously if I had positive sales, then inventory could not have been zero before, right? So those two pieces of information intuitively ought to be reflected in any sort of update that I do, and, and it is, okay? Um, and then the final comment is that even though this is sort of big and hairy and not gonna go through it, um, with a computer, this kind of thing is very easy to evaluate, and we've actually done experiments. Um, we can update an entire store of SKUs, so like 20,000 SKUs, um, using a laptop in under a second. So this is something that, you know, if you really wanted to use this in your store to sort of keep track of inventory, you can do it pretty easily, okay? All right, so this is, this is updating. So the, the point of this is that I can, I can keep these probability distributions and I can update them e easily and quickly over time. Yep, yeah. Yep. We just assume for the example that it's different, different, the different products are going to have very different. Certainly, yeah, that's right. So the inputs to this model, I need to have some estimation about what my demand distribution is. We, we saw that in the example. I need to have some estimation about sort of how, fat, how much errors are accumulating in the system. So higher price items presumably would have fewer errors accumulating than, than a lower price item. And that would be, in, that's, in, that's in here, okay? Um, it didn't really come up in the example that we were talking about. Um, and of course I need to know like what sales I observed today and things like that. It doesn't eliminate theft, right? So there's certainly a part, so a piece of the, one cost of the problem is, you know, I don't want people stealing from me because I'm actually, you know, if someone steals the TV, then I'm out of TV, right? Um, we're not really addressing that, okay? We're addressing the other side of it, which is that if someone steals a TV, suddenly I don't know what's on the shelf and what's not on the shelf, okay? Um, but this, this doesn't necessarily deter a, sh a shoplifter from actually, uh, from actually taking things. What it does is it's smart to realize that that's a possibility and we should sort of account for the fact that that might have happened. Okay? But you're right. I mean, that, that, that's a part of the problem that we, that we don't deal with. Yeah? Yep. Yep. Where, where you want to count and things like that, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. So your point is that um, I, point, I found out earlier that if I count, um, then, I, then I sort of remove all the uncertainty from the problem. Well, the moment I count, then after that, you know, the, day, the next day, the uncertainty starts to accumulate again, right? So um, it'll, if I count and I know exactly what's going on, I only know that for, today, for right now. 
And as time passes, this is going to start spreading out again um, you know, as this uncertainty sort of accumulates. So yeah, it's, like, it's sort of a never-ending never -ending process that happens. Yeah. So the, the problem is, so you're right, if I, can go, if I could go count every single day and absorb sales, then I don't really have the issue. The problem is that, that, that stores don't count every day. Um, if you think about, I mean, think about, a, think about Target or a Walmart, right? Um, to go count everything every day is sort of, it's like, you know, it's a very expensive prospect. And they zero our challenge because they don't Yep. Yep. The uncertainty is, is what happened that wasn't part of sales, right? So what if a shoplifter took something on day two? Or what if I received a replenishment and it was for the wrong amount? Um, these types of things sort of happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why, that's how the uncertainty is always sort of creeping back into the process. So, yeah? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's with the Coke and the Diet Coke example, that can happen as well. So all of these, you know, all the reasons why that we talked about earlier, these are things that can happen on a daily basis and sort of bring uncertainties to the problem. That's right. Okay. Yes. So what, hap what happens with this is that what you'll see is that um, the, the, the uncertainty tends to sort of increase over time. Now, it tends to sort of level out. Um, what you would see is that, like, if I'm, so if I count at time zero, I have no uncertainty, right? Um, and I, but I, if I, if I, the more days I go since counting, it increases, and it tends to sort of level off a little bit over time. Okay? Um, and then at some point, you may want to count again, and it sort of brings it down to zero, and you, this is kind of the cycle that you see. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. It tends to be sort of smooth, and we'll talk later. I mean, one thing that we've been working on is, is figuring out when uh, retailers should count, right? So when does this get large enough that it's sort of <coughs> unacceptable and you need to sort of bring it back down to zero? Um, and that's, that's an interesting question that I'll, if we have time, I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. Yeah. Yeah? How does it, so how do you present this uncertainty to customers? Uh, yeah, that's actually a good point. So you mean like me in my Pottery Barn example, if I call, if I call and say, "Do you have any rugs in stock?" They're like, "Well, there's a 20% chance we do." And, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, um, uh, I would argue that, like, I would argue that it's better. I mean, let's like take customer service. You know, that that sounds weird to all of us, right? Um, but let's like. Let's be honest with ourselves. Like, if we have a customer, I, my opinion is that we'd rather be honest with them, right? So rather than just sort of saying, "Well, we have three on the shelf and we really don't know," um, why don't we why don't we sort of be honest and say, "Well, we think we have one on the shelf or or not." I mean, what, the other thing you can well, the other thing that we, I should have insisted on in the Pottery Barn is that they actually go, like, physically locate one before I drove 45 minutes out there. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, Yeah, at least they're honest. They say, well, we have two, but there's a small chance that we're wrong, right? Um, whereas mine would say, well, if there's a, you know, a 2.7% chance we have seven, and, you know, <laughs> maybe more detail than we, one would need. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. Good. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay, they are, that would be conservative and I'll add more. So how do you, how do you get rid of that? 
That, that's the next thing I was going to talk about, OK? Um, all right, so we'll, let's move on to um, replenishment, OK? Um, which is really a gun's question about how do I, given this, given this uncertainty, how do I choose how much to order, OK? Um, so for this, we'll, we turn to the trusty news vendor problem. So some of you saw this a year ago, and I understand some of you saw this like two weeks ago, OK? Um, so news vendor problem <coughs> is basically, uh, and there's a joke, uh, Alan is here, has a joke that um, in the operations research, in the operations like research community, everything is a news vendor problem. And it turns out this is a news vendor problem as well. So um, <laughs> fundamentally, a news vendor problem is about matching supply and demand under uncertainty, okay? And you all are familiar with basically, so F is a demand distribution, okay? And basically, the, the idea of the news vendor is I want to, I want my, I want the demand distribution at my, my order quantity to equal something called a critical fractile, which I believe you, is cost of underage divided by cost of underage plus cost of overage, right? Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> Those of you, I, I teach operations sometimes, and just to make life difficult, um, I call it cost of shortage and cost of excess. So I get a slightly different formula, but they mean exactly the same thing, okay? Um, so this is, you all know this. Now the only thing a little bit funky about this, uh, in this particular situation, so it, uh, Wendell and, and Ada and Brian Tomlin would write Q star here, right? So basically I want my Q star, F of Q star to be the critical fractile. The only difference here is that uh, in this situation, I actually start with some, let's assume that I start with some inventory in stock, right? So start with I in stock, R star is how much I order. So how much I end up with by the time customers arrive is I plus R star. I want this, this is my Q star, okay? Um, so we all know this, all right? Um, let me play with it a little bit. These are, I think, the only equations that we have to deal with here. Um, so this is, my, this is my news vendor solution. Um, what this really means, if I just sort of translate what F means, it really just means the probability that demand is less than I plus R star. Um, I can bring the I over to the other side here, and that's the same thing. And what, what is I really? Well, I is really just the supply, right? So the news vendor problem is about matching supply with demand. Uh, I is the supply that I have right now. So demand minus supply is less than or equal to R star. This is essentially the news vendor problem, just kind of restated a little bit, OK? Um, so in a traditional news vendor problem, that you've all studied, demand is uncertain, but you know what supply is. You know how much you have or how much you're ordering. In this version of the news vendor problem, both supply and demand are uncertain. So I have uncertainty around the demand and also around the supply side. Okay. Um, so here's sort of a modified news vendor solution. It's the same thing. Uh, I'm going to choose my R star according to some distribution G equal to a critical fractile. The only difference with before, before F was our demand distribution, now G is the distribution of demand minus I. So remember I, in our situation, I is uncertain. I is what this distribution is given, is, is, is for, okay? Um, and so what you end up with is the distribution G reflects uncertainty both in demand but also in I. And it turns out this G in general has sort of more variance than F does, okay? So uh, we know that in the news vendor problem, if you have more variance, and, you know, under some, in general, when you have more variance, you're going to order more. What happens here is that you end up ordering a bit more because instead of using F, you're using G in this formula, okay? So that's like kind of the basic idea. Does that, does that help? Okay, so but the point is that given this distribution, you can actually compute this is the right amount to order given, you know, given the news vendor machinery. Okay. Um, so typically record actually causes us to order more. It turns out this is a bit of a simplified story. Um, one could write a whole academic, there's all lots of interesting things going on here with the inventory and you can write a whole academic paper about this. Um, I have, um, so if you care, there's a whole 40 page paper that talks about like all the different intricacies in solving these equations and, and more. So um, I encourage you, no, you don't have to look at that. So, um, okay. Let me, let me show you the results though. So given this sort of news vendor thing, um, this is actually from a numerical simulation. So uh, not crystal ball, but something like crystal ball. What I did is I took an inventory system and I simulated it for 90 days, okay? And the parameters that we use for this, actually I talked to you about that original gamma data. We had that data. We were able to sort of back out what the demand distributions were, what the error distribution was, and so forth and so on. And I simulated the whole system for 90 days. What I plotted here 
is my observed in stock probability or, or fill rate, if you will, um, and how much inventory I have to hold uh, on the vertical axis. So the news vendor problem is basically about getting as much down and to the right as you can, right? So if you're, if you're, if you're an, a retail inventory manager, this is nirvana for you, right? This is where I have 100% in stock to the customer, so no stock outs, and I accomplish it by holding no inventory in the store, okay? I have no stock out costs and I have no holding costs, so this is great. Um, and of course, you, we can't get here. Um, even if I had full information, so the blue curve here is even, forget record inaccuracy, suppose that I had you know, perfect visibility into what was on the shelf, the blue is as far as I can get um, down to this corner, okay? Um, the red is, suppose that I just pretended I didn't have record inaccuracy and I just sort of did the old fashioned thing. This is what most retailers actually do. They sort of forget about record inaccuracy and they just solve the problem as if, as if the inventory record was right. Um, and that gives you the red here. And with this, base, with this base inventory record, we're able to get the green curve in the middle, okay? So, you know, we're not able, to, you know, the best we could expect to do is the blue. We're not quite there, um, but we are significantly better than the red at the same time. So sort of the lesson here is that um, even with, with a pretty simple investment, I mean, this is basically just kind of reprogramming your information system. There's no sort of physical investments here at all. Uh, you can get, you know, roughly like, a third to a half of the way um, from sort of the, so the naive solution to the best case, all right. Um, and in particular, you know, if you think, if you look, say here, to get the same service level, um, instead of holding roughly six, I can hold roughly three um, to get the same service level. So that's actually pretty, that's pretty good news, okay. Um, the next thing, I'll, I'll, I won't talk much about it, but if I take this point, this point, and this point. These are all points that give me roughly like 94% in stock probability, all right? I can sort of plot the dynamics of these over time. Uh, full information, if you have full information, the demand distribution here is sort of constant, so I'm always gonna order the same thing. Um, so the, the blue curve is sort of flat. The red curve actually increases over time. Um, if you think about it, this is a company that is trying to get 94% service level, Half the time, this sort of crashes down to zero, they get this inventory freezing. Half the time, they sort of end up ordering way too much, depending on how the errors turn out. And in, in the end, what happens is, in order to maintain a 94% service level, they have to sort of really increase inventory a lot over time. Uh, in our system, this is kind of the, the picture I drew over there. Um, that inventory I hold, sort of it, it increases, but it sort of levels off over time as you sort of come to grips with the uncertainty in the system. So th this, is, this, is how this, this is how this proposal uh, performs in terms of replenishment, okay? Um, and like I said, there's more details, details avail available if you'd like. Um, so just to summarize, a replenishment based on this Bayesian inventory record achieves a better sales inventory trade-off than does the naive policy. Um, in particular, we can see 20, 20 to 30% um, reduction in holding costs um, you can actually show, I can show mathematically that you don't have freezing in this situation. So that's this sort of, there's no way, you know, freezing is sort of automatically prevented if you use this proposal. Um, and one sort of interesting thing about this is if you're, if, you're, if you're a retail store and you're considering investing in RFID, you can actually quantify it through this. So investing in RFID essentially, assuming the RFID is sort of a perfect, you know, it works perfectly, it kind of gets you to the blue. Um, well, you ought to compare that to sort of the best you could do without RFID, and I think I would argue that the green is pretty close to the best you can do uh, without RFID, okay? So this, the, a, a sort of a side benefit that even if you don't implement this, it gives you a nice evaluation of how much should RFID be worth to you, okay? All right. Um, we have a few minutes left. Let's talk about auditing for a little bit. So if you think about what the retailer, what the retail manager can do, he can, he can place orders, and he can count, okay? Um, there's kind of three different varieties of inventory counting that happens in retail stores commonly. So the first is um, kind of the store-wide annual audit. So that, you know, you've probably seen this. Stores will, well, once a year or so, often will close down. They put a sign on the door. There's like people in like pulling all-nighters on the inside, counting up everything and sort of resorting it and things like that. So um, this is kind of the, the nuclear option of, of, of auditing, okay? 
Um, the second is something called cycle counting, and, and a lot of stores have this in place. What it basically means is that I periodically will sort of go around and count things. Um, what they'll usually do is they'll divide up the different SKUs in their store into sort of some categories like an A, B, C. Uh, a categories they might count very often, C categories they don't count very often, and they sort of have predetermined schedules for doing this. Okay? Um, the third one is something called a zero balance walk that some retailers do, and this basically means um, periodically, like once a day or once a week, uh, employees will sort of walk around the store and look for empty shelves. Um, the idea here is that this is the easiest way to count. Like, you know, the easiest items to count are ones that are empty, and basically these are some of also the ones I'm most concerned about. So you'll walk around and you'll look, and if there's something empty, then you'll kind of report that back. Okay. Um, this is a this is effective and cheap. There's a there's a there's a danger with zero balance walks. Okay. So uh, we've seen data from stores that do zero balance walks. What do you think the data looks like? Do you think my record record accuracy don't go away? Do you think they tend to be Underestimating what I have on the shelf or overestimating what I have on the shelf? They actually overestimate. So the reason is that if, if, if I underestimate, I'm likely to find that through a zero balance walk, right? The ones that are sort of bursting at the seams, I don't find with a zero balance walk. And so I tend to, I, I'm finding the ones that are on the low side, but I don't find the ones that are on the high side. Over the long run, you end up sort of getting biased upward. So we've looked at this a little bit. Um, what we're actually working on right now, this is actually some ongoing work. Um, that is working, we're actually working with a national spe specialty retail chain, so it's a, it's a decent sized chain, so 200 stores, about 6,000 SKUs per store. Once again, I'm not allowed to tell you who it is. Um, but what their question basically is every day, um, what 10 or what 20 SKUs should we count in the day? So we think of this as sort of a dynamic cycle counting policy. On a given day, sort of what's the top 10 list of things that we should check? Um, so let's talk about what factors would you consider. So if, you're, if, if the store came to you and asked you this question, what, I mean, what SKUs are you going to think about recommending? Alex? Probably the fastest moving and where the most traffic. Okay, so certainly price um, and maybe, maybe sort of velocity would, be, would come into play, right? Certainly that. Christina, you get the same idea, okay? I hate it when that happens. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, some, in some sense, sort of the stock out cost, or you know, you know, in so, price would sort of be this is how we approached it. So, this dynamic cycle accounting policy. The question is, uh, what's the value of an audit to today's operation? Okay. Or in some sense, what's the value of an audit? Right. So, how do I quantify the value of an audit? Um, yeah. Sure. Okay. So you meaning like bring, bring in some external people and things like that? Okay. All right, fair enough. Um, we, we're, remember, we're thinking about starting with this Bayesian inventory record, right? So I have this, I have this probability distribution, and I'd like to know what would, uh, what would be the value if I was able to resolve this uncertainty, right? So, or to put it another way, um, suppose that I had, say, a set of magic tea leaves or fortune teller um, who could tell me exactly what's on the shelf. Right? How much would this be worth to me? Um, you may have heard of something called expected value of perfect information. Okay? I know you all have because I told it to you. Okay? Um, so the, here's the idea. We actually, believe it or not, we use this in a real application. So um, here's, the, here's the argument. Basically compute the, the news vendor cost given sort of the, the current Bayesian inventory record that you have. This, remember this G and the news vendor and things like that. Um, now compute the news vendor cost if an inventory auditor or fortune teller or magic tea leaves were to tell me exactly what's on the shelf, right? And the difference between these two things gives you the value. How much should it be worth to you to audit this particular SKU, right? And these are computations that, that we can do. Um, one way to visualize this is as a decision tree. Um, so here is the news vendor problem as a decision tree. Um, basically, at the beginning, you decide how much to order. Do I order 0, 1, or up to 10? Um, once I place my order, then I find out uh, how much was on the shelf. And then given that, you can figure out the news vendor costs associated with those things. Okay? This is if we don't audit. So we have to, I have to order first, and only then do I find out what's on the shelf. Um, if I do audit, I basically flip the, the <laughs> chance node and the decision node. So now I have a chance node first. I first find out how much is on the shelf. And then given that knowledge, I can decide how much to order. 
Okay. So if I audit, this is this is what happens to me, and we know um, that when you do this type of a thing, you, that there's a, there's always a, you know this is always going to be more expensive than this. Okay. And the difference gives me sort of some estimate of how much is how much the value is going to be of auditing. Yeah. Of inventory freezing. Um, it sort of comes into play here. So when I compute the news vendor cost here, that includes holding costs and includes stockout costs and these types of things, right? So inventory freezing is sort of an extreme version of being stocked out, and that's sort of taken into account. But, but there's, there's another point, which is that this, this is just sort of dealing with the one period version of it. So just worried about sort of how, what happened, how's the audit help me better face today's traffic? Um, it doesn't really worry so much about the future. Okay. Um, but we can take the future into account, and if we do that, I'm sparing you the details. Um, it turns out that if it costs K dollars to audit something, I audit whenever EVPI times tau is greater than three times K. So tau is how many days since the last audit. I take how many days since the last audit, I multiply times EVPI, which I you know, computed by comparing those two decision trees. Um, and if the three is sort of a magic number that you have to read the paper to figure out why. Um, but the, but the idea is that this is a very simple rule, right? Like I c it's very easy in my database to sort of compute these things and make this comparison and decide which things are worth, you know, I kind of get a positive NPV from auditing today, okay? Um, or alternatively, if you really just want a list, I can prioritize the SKUs by tau times EVPI, okay? Um, so what we're in the process of doing, I and mean, there's a lot of other complexities here that, that are involved, what we're in the process of doing is trying to implement this um, for this, the, this retailer, they're going to—they're doing it. They're, the plan is for them to do a pilot and sort of uh, get a sense for how this is going to work. So we're excited about that. Um, if we can get it to work, so. Um, okay, so this is, this is cycle counting, and I, with that, I'm pretty much done. I have a few results. Um, these are just some more simulated results on the cycle counting. It turns out it does pretty well. Um, let me just sort of summarize. Um, first point: retailers don't necessarily know on the shelf. This is sort of a, re a reality that I'd like to make you aware of. Um, our proposal is this Bayesian inventory record, which we can easily compute and as forms an effective basis of replenishment and counting policies. Um, I would like to just highlight briefly the impacts of this. Number one, of course, the retailers be, are better at matching supply and demand. Um, in terms of better counting, they can work, make more efficient use of the store labor they have available to them. Um, they can actually do better demand estimation if you have sort of a better idea of, of what, you know, what, what loss of sales are, are legitimate and which ones are illegitimate. And I mentioned briefly quantifying the benefits of RFID. Um, ongoing work, this, you know, in academics, there's always more theoretical work to be done. I'm working on some of it. Um, but but the, other, the other part that I'm excited about um, is, is working toward this field study um, where we have to do some estimation and some of this uh, cycle counting stuff as well. Um, we have very early results here. So this is, if I, if I sort all, the, all my different SKUs, this is a set of SKUs, uh, about 3,000 of them, in which um, the, the last audit we have in our data has about 1,300 errors in it. And um, what we're trying to do is use the past to try to figure out, you know, try to pick out these errors as much as possible. And so what the, the way to read this is if I counted 500 SKUs, I'd find 300 errors. Um, versus if I just randomly picked 500 SKUs, I'd find about 200 errors. So we're getting some lift in terms of how much, uh, how much we're able to find. So okay, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Any other questions? Christina? I have a question about uh, the uncertainty. Yeah. Um, We, we certainly could. Um, the data, the old data we have was for the, was basically for the one company, and it actually varies. I mean, it varies, this is kind of the average, um, but it varies a lot by SKU or even just by particular time period you're looking at. So in reality, um, it sort of squiggles, you know, it'll squiggle very high, squiggle very low, and this is sort of average, average look. Um, but certainly, yeah, but I think certainly something of interest is if we, can, if we can do a good job in the estimation to sort of compare different stores and compare different firms and sort of see, um, get a sense for some of the underlying drivers of it. That's right. Yes? So in this case, you also apply to other areas like manufacturing inventory or direct mail. And then is there, is the uncertainty in those areas Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I sort of focus on the retail side. 
And there's, there's, a few, there's a few aspects here that are somewhat unique to the retail side. So one of them is um, sort of this, there's a, I didn't talk a lot about it, but we have sort of the notion of lost sales here. So if, if demand comes and I don't have enough in stock, the customer just goes away, which is a kind of a very typical thing in retail. Um, distribution centers, for instance, also have record inaccuracy. Um, but the lost sales assumption isn't quite as good there. There, you, you would imagine that if we don't have enough in stock as a distribution center, we either would back order it or we'd sort of let you know, and it's a little bit more interactive in that sense. Um, but certainly, I think certainly some of the tools here, maybe with some modifications, would be useful in those situations as well. That's right. 